Americans understand that some people will earn more money than others. CEO pay, it's now 350 times the average worker. And we don't resent those who, by virtue of their efforts, achieve incredible success. You have to do unpaid internships to get a job. That's just the way it goes here. But Americans overwhelmingly agree that no one who works full time should ever have to raise a family in poverty. I'm announcing my resignation from the United Nations internship program. I want to make it very clear that the UN did not ask me to leave or pressure me to make this decision in any way. David Leo Hyde was an unpaid intern at the United Nations in 2015. His story captures something of what it means to be young today and entering the labor market. So I remember as I was going through university, I started hearing more and more of my friends talking about how they needed to intern, either as part of their course or to get some experience in the hopes of getting a job eventually. It seemed like it was almost, if not obligatory, then highly recommended that you take on one of these internship experiences. Um, and so that's kind of like when it first came onto my radar was definitely at university and it was definitely seemed like it was a very normative thing to do. Together with his girlfriend, Natalie Berger, David decided to investigate. So that's when we got this idea that we would both apply for unpaid internships and the first person to get one would do the internship and, I mean, be a real intern and go to work and do all these things while the other filmed it to kind of document something about, uh, about how young people in the world today are entering the labour market. Right. And so, tell me about the process of applying. So, yeah, we started getting our CVs together. You know how it is. You have to list all the places that you worked since you were nine years old and, and your hobbies and all these things. And, um, and so this is even for unpaid work. Yeah. Like the idea yeah, sure. that you still build out yeah. this big CV. Sure. So some people think that getting an unpaid internship is, is easy, that you just slide right in there. But actually, you still have to do the whole process. You have to prepare a cover letter. And I mean, we must have spent weeks just writing cover letters for jobs, uh, which ultimately we didn't really want to do. We kind of wanted to get it more to investigate it than do the job itself. So yeah, we sent out thousands of applications that took a long, long, long time just to land an unpaid job. After months of applying, we, we got a response. I'd been accepted for a United Nations uh, internship. And uh, it was actually, the, the final process was pretty easy. Uh, it was a phone interview. She asked me basic questions. Uh, and she told me on the interview, you know, there's people with PhDs, which kind of tells you something crazy when people with PhDs are applying for unpaid work. Um, and she, yeah, at the end of the phone call, she said, OK, we want you to start in one week. And that's what happened. Almost immediately, however, he ran into the problem of cost. Renting in Geneva would cost him upward of $10,000 over the six-month internship period. Instead of spending his life savings, David decided to take the unusual step of living in a tent. But that wasn't the main reason I chose to live in the tent. The main reason was, I guess I grew up, like, uh, came through political puberty during Occupy. The tent seemed like uh, this, this symbol which kind of represented the way that they leave you with nothing, the way that they don't provide any help for accommodation or food or healthcare or transport. Yeah, so it came, came to kind of represent that, that whole internship policy. The government has decided to not pay the tax, which is already open, so that has been more than two years that we are mobilizing for the regeneration of all the stages. It has been more than two years that the ministers and the establishments don't pay their tax, are on the ground, are on the ground of the lutte, and the land of the land. In 2018, 58,000 students took to the streets in Montreal, protesting against unpaid internships, often a compulsory part of their courses. Many of the students had to work full-time jobs on top of their existing internship programs. I'm working three part-time jobs right now, uh, plus my internship, plus class. It's really hard for me because I would, I would do eight hours a day per, for an internship and then I would have to go work uh, like a six-hour shift right after my, my internship, so it was really hard. Students studying social work say that they're not just learning on the job, but acting as full-blown employees. 
people that are taken are, are expected to, to provide uh, almost equitable services as professionals, as in house visits, uh, making intervention plans, uh, di uh, um, helping on diagnoses, uh, child care plans. We're, we're essentially workers. Often what we'll hear is that, oh well, uh, community organizations and government organizations are underfunded, so they would never have the money to pay us. But that's exactly what we're saying, is that they are underfunded, and because they are underfunded, they rely on free work from us. Departments from three universities and four CEGIPs are participating. Student internships do not fall under Quebec's labor laws, so they don't have the same norms or protections for employees. From Montreal to Geneva, London to Sydney, I'd heard stories of how difficult it was for young people to break into the labour market. But I set out to discover just how widespread the problem really was. I began by talking to Peter Van Shee, a former director of Youth, Employment and Social Services at The Hague. I wanted to ask him whether young people had always had precarious work, or if this was something new. Uh, I think the situation of young people uh, in general is, is pretty... Uh, different from the old days. Uh, so uh, I believe that you uh, specifically asked me because I was a little bit older. Huh? <laughs> I think the situation now, I mean, uh, we've, we've gone through a really bad youth employment crisis, I think, and I still think there are some major hiccups in the system. You have young people who have been graduating and, and not getting into a job within six months. And if this happens, then you're the, 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 the chance of you not having a job five years later, it's very big. It didn't used to be this way. It used to be that you would get your degree and that was enough to then get you into your first job. So I think generation-wise, there is a bit of a market difference between what you have to do now versus then. Our research that we did last year shows that 87% of internships are unpaid and 60% are actually illegal. This has been backed by a few other people that have done research, is that they're growing. The, the trend is upwards and significantly in terms of unpaid internships. And so how do they sell it? How do they sell the idea that you're going to work for nothing but you're going to get a lot out of it? What do they say you're going to get out of it? Well, I mean, I think we've all heard the buzzwords, you know, it's a great opportunity, you'll get valuable experience, make good connections, it's about networking, it's about getting your foot on the ladder, la di la di la. All these words, all these phrases are used to jazz up something because ultimately if the person themselves doesn't feel that they're going to benefit later on down the road, then uh, they're not going to do it at all. So it's also the, 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 the how you say that, the, is that a, the paradox yeah. that, that, that young people need work, work experience to get work experience. And, and I think that a lot of young people start off wrong, on the wrong food, and also not getting enough chances on the jobs they deserve. Not in generations has Wall Street absorbed the number of body blows it took today. The American financial system is rocked to its foundation as top Wall Street institutions topple under a mountain of debt. When you step back for just a moment, consider the events uh, of the last few days. It is truly unbelievable. Everyone I talked to pointed to the 2008 financial crisis as a turning point. A time when companies began to cut costs in hiring with unpaid internships and the casualization of existing staff. This became known as the gig economy. The mix of ride-sharing, food, and package delivery apps like Lyft, Uber, or Amazon Flex, which tout flexible hours and how you can be your own boss. It's innovative. It's a real change in our labor market. It allows a lot of flexibility. Most workers who use it are doing it to supplement their income. There are people, believe it or not, who actually like doing different jobs and trying different things. I feel like young people have the, the sense that they're going to be more mobile than their parents were. Like, one, they're going to have to be mobile to, to go where the work is. Um, but also just you can. Um, and so you can live in somewhere cheaper and do work remotely and then when you get sick of that move somewhere else. Like that's how I imagine 
my life would go. But obviously that leaves crippling insecurity. <laughs> for... No, of course. Of course. <laughs> like it's That's not all happy-go-lucky, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that the gig economy was pretty clearly not designed by young people who needed flexibility at work. It's pretty clear that it was designed by corporations looking for a way to divert existing labor conditions to undercut the market. I mean, we see it in the taxi industry. No one's defending the old model of, of, of taxi work. I mean, often it wasn't great. You didn't have great conditions to begin with. What companies like Uber have gone in and done and said, you're no longer an employee, you're self-contracted, you're an entrepreneur, you're making your own way and we're not responsible for anything. We're not responsible for your insurance or healthcare. It's, it's shifting the cost onto the individual and away from society or employer. These platforms enable people to experience a lot of autonomy but they also have very powerful control mechanisms. Because if you, if you ever get a, an Uber somewhere, you'll have to give the worker a rating at the end of that trip. And if the worker continues to get bad ratings, they'll then be deactivated or essentially fired. I think that people who make the claim that young people are, are driving this, this move to gig economy ignore the fact that young people are faced with a choice where they can either accept this Uber job or remain unemployed. I mean when we have 20% youth uh, unemployment in many, many countries, I mean, the choice just isn't there. Often it is those who can least afford it who lose out on these work opportunities. Unpaid internships are a way to entrench privilege and disadvantage, I think, on like just a base level. The biggest effect of unpaid internships is also the one that we hear about the least. It's the people who never got the chance to step into those shoes in the first place. So if they're in a circumstance where um, you know they're having to do another job to support themselves, if they're living out of home, if they don't have the support from their parents, and then on top of that potentially also having to do study for their degree or whatever and there's only a certain amount of hours in the week, then it does become an equity issue where you're not getting a diverse pool of people from different backgrounds and regions and everything. Often people think that it's just a Western thing. We've found unpaid interns in Kenya and Uganda and South Africa and in India and in China working uh, at the Foxconn factories. It seems like in this globalised world, the internship thing is becoming a globalised employment practice. Along with unpaid work or precarious work, in many countries, young people are increasingly graduating with a great deal of student debt. My colleagues on the platform did not pay for their education, and indeed many had maintenance grants to sustain them at university. You have had to pay fees, and you emerge as graduates with an enormous burden of debt. No other country in Europe, including Scotland, imposes fees on university students. Successive British governments that have imposed and then raised fees have, in my view, acted shamefully, in effect creating a tax on knowledge and skills. <laughs> and they should hang their heads in shame. These fees are also an intergenerational justice because those who enjoyed free education are not being required to contribute to the cost of your education through taxation. So students leave university with a huge burden of debt and that contrasts rather sharply um, with the small profit <laughs> that, uh, uh, that, that students who were careful um, were, were getting 40 years ago. And you think that universities should be basically not-for-profit in terms of their, yeah. their goals? Uh, yes. Um, mm -hmm. And the goal is to further knowledge rather than some business goal? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a basic question. Yeah. But <laughs> um, the, the, the notion that, that universities um, are utilitarian institutions uh, that should be regarded as businesses that prosper or fail um, it seems to me not the way ahead. It doesn't produce enhanced standards, it doesn't produce an educated citizenry and it, it, won't, fill, it won't feed into the skill space that the country needs.
So what does the future hold for young people entering the labour market? We'd love to, for it to get better, um, but I think unless if there's some decent change in the next five years, it probably will eventually become to a state that's not dissimilar to the US, where it is a virtual, like everyone has to take, and it would be um, finish high school, do your degree, and then do an unpaid internship, and then get your job. And we definitely don't want it to get to that state, but we think we're probably in a bit of a contention point within the next five years that something needs to change. The law needs to be clearer, people need to understand the issue better for it something to happen, but yeah, otherwise it could get could get worse. I think that part of the reason our generation is described as apolitical is because we grew up under an ideology which told us that there is no alternative. Until an alternative is offered or until we claim one, there can't be the meaningful changes to the economy that we need. There can't be an improvement in, in working conditions which have suffered in the past 30 years. There can't be increased wages. There can't be reduced inequality. It's our generation's job to break through that, to, to claim that, sure, we grew up in, in a world where there was no obvious, you know, uh, Russia versus the United States or something so clear-cut as that, but that doesn't mean that politics has gone away. Actually, it's, it's more present than ever. In August 2015, David resigned from his unpaid internship at the United Nations, promising to keep fighting against inequality. Interns all over the world need to come together and push for the recognition of our value and our equal rights that we deserve. Because, as the Declaration of Human Rights states so clearly, everyone without discrimination has the right to equal pay for equal work. Everyone who works has the right to just and favourable remuneration. A few weeks later, Ban Ki-moon the UN Secretary General was confronted at a press conference. My question is, when will the UN address its unjust, unpaid internship policy? <laughs> I hope you are, you are not uh, one of them, but, you know, I... <coughs> Apparently, yes. I <laughs> sympathize with that. But you should, you should really understand, you know, I'm not trying to make any excuse or explanations the United Nations has a long-held um, uh, system or position that uh, we do not provide any financial support to the interns. The interns are normally uh, supported by sending organizations or sending governments. Because of a lack of funding, the member states are very strict. They do not pay any additional uh, money except this assessed contribution and peacekeeping operations. It's uh, very tough. Therefore, we don't have uh, these resources. When I was young, I definitely dreamed of working at the United Nations. Um, yeah, I had that idealism and I thought that it was in an organization which, uh, which is meant to change things. You've talked to the group lobbying the White House to pay interns. What did they tell you about why the interns should get paid? Well, they're saying that the president has been stumping for months for a higher minimum wage, yet at the same time, he has people working for free in the White House. So they're asking the president to step up and set an example for other employers. And why is all this outrage mounting now? Well, it's really been the summer of the unpaid intern. We've seen a number of interns take, take their former employers to court, actually, from places like Fox Searchlight and Hearst Magazine, and it's really coming to a head because young people just can't afford to work for free when they're staring mountains of student loans in the face. There are some trends out there that have been battering the middle class for a long, long time, well before this great recession hit. And in some ways, some of those trends have gotten worse, not better. You know, the nature of today's economy with technology and globalization means that there are folks at the top who are doing better than ever, but average wages have barely budged. Average incomes have not gone up. Too many Americans are working harder than ever just to keep up. At the heart of America, the central premise of this country is the chance to achieve your dreams if you work hard, if you take responsibility, that it doesn't matter where you start, it's where you finish. That's what makes America the place that it is, why it continues to be a beacon, attracting people from all around the world. The idea that you can make it here if you try.